Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. And the first thing I want to do is say thank you to Megan Davis, one of our longtime members in Texas, who found this article and sent it to me. She was inspired by a, uh, an advanced study um, couple of classes that we did on this book called The Forgotten Cure. And so I was really excited to get this and, and write an article on it and share this information with you. I think you're going to find this one of the most fascinating things. Well, I, I'll, I'll just cushion this a little bit. I'm a nerd and a science geek, so maybe you won't be fascinated at all, but I'm really interested in this. Okay. Um, let's start with the incidence of antibiotic resistant infections is going up. Everybody knows that. Um, the problem, big problem, is it's no longer confined to hospitals and really sick people. Infections like MRSA and C. diff are showing up in community settings where people haven't even been to a hospital in the last you know, 10 years. Um, which one of the things that makes this even worse is that there is no pipeline right now with a whole bunch of antibiotics that are going to come to market anytime soon. And one of the reasons for this is that drug companies really do prefer, and I, and I understand this from a business standpoint, developing a drug that somebody takes for their whole life is so much more profitable than developing a drug that you take for seven days or 14 days when you have an infection. So it's going to get worse as a result of more antibiotic resistant infections and no new drugs in the pipeline. The World Health Organization says that by 2050, antibiotic resistant bacterial infections will kill over 50 million people per year. That is a lot of humans. Now the solution to the pending crisis may be in a therapy that was discovered over 100 years ago, which has been used successfully in other countries. Bacteriophages, or phages as they're called, Phages are viruses that are found everywhere bacteria can be found. There are almost an unlimited supply of them, collectively constituting more organisms than any others on Earth. The viruses can be used to target and infect specific bacteria without any, affecting any of the other cells in the body. Phages were accidentally discovered by French-Canadian microbiologist Félix Durel and have been successfully used to treat infections, often in people who have developed antibiotic-resistant infections. Um, they, no antibiotics work at all. And uh, under a microscope, just to tell you what the little critters look like, they look a little bit like insects. They have round polyhedral heads, uh, long bodies, spider-like legs, and they even have tails. And they're really tiny. They're about the 140th the size of a bacterial cell. Phages work by docking onto the wall of a bacteria and injecting their DNA into the cell. The DNA then shuts down the cell's reproductive capacity and instead reprograms it to make more phages instead. Well, as the phages multiply, there become so many of them, they literally burst out of the cell, and then they go looking for other bacteria to do this to. Um, the ability to produce more of themselves is really the key thing here because it enables the phages to overwhelm a bacteria and get rid of it. There are several reasons why phages haven't become more mainstream. Well, one is the introduction of antibiotics back in the 1940s. The drugs were heavily promoted by drug companies. They were very easy to administer. And the public gratefully sighed with relief that, you know, thinking that people were no longer going to die of bacterial infections. Another reason is that while broad-spectrum antibiotics can be used to treat a variety of bacterial infections, phages are really specific to a particular infection. The development of phages is labor-intensive, and phage therapy can really be thought of more as a process than a product. In fact, one of the barriers to making phage therapy mainstream is the FDA. When companies involved in phage research have tried to get FDA approval for phage therapy, the agency has demanded that each phage be subjected, subjected to a clinical trial. Well, this is incredibly and prohibitively expensive, but another issue is the time lag for FDA approval for each phage would result in people dying from their infections before the specific phage needed to treat them would ever be approved for use. So one of the things that's been suggested is that the FDA should approve the process, much like they have the flu vaccine. In other words, every year the vaccine addresses different viral strains, but um, they don't have to, the drug companies don't have to go to the FDA for approval for each specific strain of virus. Last but not least, like all medical treatment, phages can cause side effects, and one of them is the potential for the viral and bacterial um, genes to mingle and result in a new virus or a new bacteria that is even more deadly than the one that the phage was used to treat. And there are, there are a couple of instances in history where that has happened. Nonetheless, phages have been researched and studied for over 100 years, and they've saved the lives of many people, including some very famous people. 
Today, if you live in the United States and you need or want phage therapy, you have to travel to, travel to the Eliava Institute in the Republic of Georgia since the therapy is not approved in the United States. But something that happened recently may make it more likely that perhaps phages could be more available sooner in the United States. So the United States military has been conducting research on phages for a long time, decades in fact. Researchers and scientists at the U.S. Navy Medical Research Center and the University of California San Diego School of Medicine recently joined, joined forces to save a patient from almost certain death with phage therapy. The group has submitted an article on what happened to a, a medical journal for publication and they're going to be presenting their data shortly at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. The patient who received the treatment is Tom Patterson, PhD. He's a professor at the Department of Psychiatry at UC San Diego School of Medicine. Tom's wife, who plays a major role in this whole thing, is Stephanie Strathdee, Chief of the Division of Global Public Health at the Department of Medicine. The two were vacationing in Egypt when Tom became very ill. He had abdominal pain, fever, nausea, and vomiting. He was diagnosed with pancreatitis and treated in Egypt. Well, the treatment didn't work, so they airlifted Tom to Frankfurt, Germany. Doctors there determined that he had an infection with an antibiotic strain of bacteria, and he was given the only antibiotics that have any effect on this particular bacteria. Well, that got him better enough to return to the United States where he was admitted to the hospital and placed in the ICU. The crisis started when an internal drain designed to keep the infection localized slipped and bacteria spilled into Tom's abdomen and bloodstream. He immediately went into septic shock and slipped into a coma which lasted for almost two months and he was clearly dying. Well, Tom's wife wasn't ready to give up, so she started looking into alternative therapies, and during her search, one of her colleagues mentioned that a friend with a life-threatening infection had gone to Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia for phage therapy, and she was cured. So subsequently, Strathdew was able to engage a team of researchers at the San Diego State University, headed by Forrest Rauer, to purify phages that would be effective for Tom's particular bacterial infection. Dr. Robert Schooley, Chief of Infectious Diseases at UC San Diego School of Medicine, sought and was granted an emergency investigational new drug application from the FDA so that he could legally give the phages to Tom. Within three days of starting IV phage therapy, Tom emerged from the coma. In just a little while longer, the respirator was removed and the blood pressure drugs were discontinued. There were still challenges, which included a few more bouts of sepsis, and Tom's infection developed resistance to the phages, which required that the research team develop some new ones from viruses found in sewage. By the way, that's where they find the viruses to turn into phages. They go pick up sewage, either from waste product at hospitals or drainage pipes and that sort of thing. You find lots of bacteria and viruses there. Well, in spite of all this, within a short time, there was no evidence of the bacteria that had caused all of this in Tom's body. A few months later, he was sent home. Now, recovery continues to be a challenge. Tom lost 100 pounds, most of it muscle, while he was in the hospital. He's undergoing intense rehab at this time to regain his strength, but he hopes that his experience will help others. He says that phage therapy was a miracle for him, and it's been a privilege to be the experimental patient that could prove the benefit of this therapy. Well, this privilege is not likely to be available to others. There were some exceptional things that happened here. I mean, both Tom and his wife were trained scientists. They both worked at a medical center. They had money and determination and access to people who could help. They were very lucky in that the doctors at UC San Diego School of Medicine were open-minded enough to try a highly, what's considered a highly experimental therapy on a desperately ill person. Most people in this situation would not have such a happy ending. You know, there's a lot of talk about the importance of personalized medicine, and phage therapy is the ultimate personalized medicine, with each phage cocktail prepared specifically for a patient and his or her very specific infection. Yet the FDA remains uninterested in facilitating the approval of phage therapy, at least at this time. For now, an American with a potentially fatal bacterial infection must travel to Tbilisi for treatment at the Eliava Institute. But the opportunity to be saved by phages is not only dependent on having the financial ability to do this, but also knowing that such an option is even available. Most people don't know about phage therapy, and many suffer for long periods of time, and antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections remain a cause of death for thousands annually. And so to illustrate the point, I'm just going to read you one little story that's at the very end of this book on phage therapy, which we covered in an advanced study. 
And um, there is one little organization in the United States that screens people to go to Eliava Institute in the Republic of Georgia. And um, the first case uh, that's described in this book for this, for this particular organization uh, was um, the most dramatic. Laura Roberts, a single mother from Fort Worth, Texas, had suffered for more than a decade from a chronic sinus infection brought on by severe allergies. The combination spiraled out of control. The allergies led to asthma and the infection grew resistant to antibiotics. I just kept getting worse and worse, says Roberts, now 57. She developed a host of other medical problems, bone loss from the steroids she was taking for asthma, hip replacement surgery for the bone loss, fibromyalgia, migraines, fatigue, and weight loss. Her ear, nose, and throat doctor, Dr. Natalie Roberge of Texas Ear, Nose, and Throat, had Roberts on and off IV antibiotics as well as IV immunoglobulins to boost her immune system. Roberts was seeing 12 specialists, including infectious disease experts, a rheumatologist, and a neurologist. She just wouldn't respond to anything, said Roberge. Finally, in September 2005, Roberge sent Roberts to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Roberts spent nine days there working with some of the country's top experts on her condition, allergic fungal sinusitis, an allergy where the body overreacts to molds in the air. In her case, the constant swelling in her nasal passages had led to the growth of Staph aureus bacteria, which at first were sensitive to antibiotics but later became resistant. The doctors at the Mayo Clinic threw up their hands. There were no antibiotics left to try. They said they didn't expect me to live past the end of 2005, she said. That's when Roberts remembered a program she had seen on television that mentioned the Eliava Institute, the same episode that 48 hour, uh, 48 hours that Sahara Bledsoe, another story in the book, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, had seen. Back home in her bed, where she'd been confined for months before her trip to Rochester, she called her younger brother, Andrew Silva, and asked him to investigate. In the years between Fred Bledsoe and Laura Roberts, Phage International had sprung up. Now communication with Tbilisi was easier, if more expensive. Individual treatments cost five to $15,000, not including airfare and hotel. Dr. Roberge was skeptical about her patient's plans, but gave her consent. I've never been somebody who's big into alternative medicine, but at that point she was so sick and we were making no progress, she says. Robert's had bacterial samples prepared and sent to Tbilisi, where a doctor there quickly found matching phages and Roberts and her bro brother quickly booked a flight out. In Tbilisi, the doctor and a team of other doctors treated Roberts in a new modern clinic. Roberts and her brother went there every day for three weeks for treatment with a variety of medicines, including phages. Roberts describes a vigorous, mor a rigorous morning regimen at the clinic. Workers would flush out her nasal and ear passages with saline then apply electrical stimulants to her sinuses to break up the mucus. Then, using long, thin instruments, they would apply gauze soaked in honey extract uh, to her nasal passages. Honey is believed to have antibiotic and anti-inflammatory properties. But it's actually not believed. It's proven there are several articles in medical journals that document this. Finally, the doctors would drip phages into her sinuses and blow powdered dried phages into her ears. At night, in her hotel, Roberts would put a few more drops of phages in her sinuses. She said she started feeling better almost immediately. On her first night following treatment, she kept her dinner down for the first time in recent memory. The next day, she felt hungry for the first time in years. A few days later, she shed the socks that, and gloves she wore even indoors for warmth. By the third week, we were doing things like going to the museum or going sightseeing after her treatment, said her brother. We couldn't believe it. Toward the end, we felt like we were on a little vacation. Roberts had arrived with a cane and walker and left without them. Back in Fort Worth, her ENT, Dr. Roberge, couldn't believe her eyes. It was remarkable how much better she looked, said Roberge. Roberts used to come into the office every week to have her sinuses and eustachian tubes drained, but now everything was dry. Because Roberts was treated with many different things, it's hard to know if it was really phages that cured her, but to Dr. Roberge, the evidence is pretty clear. It was either phages or it was a miracle, she says. Five years later, Roberts has returned to Tbilisi twice to treat two, two new infections. In total, she said she spent $12,000 from her savings on the treatments, not including the hotel and airfare. But to her, it was worth it. She's resumed all of her previous activities, including taking care of her daughter, who's now in college. We do know that in single cases, phages work, but there are still so many things that science needs to research before phages can be used widely, says one doctor who trained under another doctor in Tbilisi. If you haven't read the book, some of this wouldn't mean much to you. Among the same things that scientists need to learn, how do phages reach bacteria? How can researchers make them work more efficiently and effectively? Why are there cases where phage therapy fails? 
Until researchers find the money and the resources to uncover those answers, phage therapy's promise will remain unfulfilled. So I started this by saying that I hope that this recent episode with people who have some money and influence and um, the, there's a lot of publicity about this story right now that I'm relating to you. I'm hoping that we take this from a therapy that saves the lives of a handful of people who know and have the resources to take advantage of it and it becomes more widely available because to allow us to get to the place where the World Health Organization is predicting where we're going to lose 50 million people a year to antibiotic resistant bacterial infections it's just unthinkable particularly not when something promising could solve the problem. All right, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.